It's October 6th here in Seoul and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour. Starting with Russia's hinting at a resumption of nuclear testing. Leader Vladimir Putin says his country has successfully tested a nuclear-powered and nuclear-capable cruise missile. Reports also say North Korea is transferring arms for the war in Ukraine. And while the second round of Fukushima wastewater release is ongoing in Japan, South Korea's Oceans Ministry said the first release met international standards and asked Japan for safe discharge and transparent info sharing at the 45th London Convention. The World Trade Organization halves this year's goods trade growth forecast to 0.8 percent, pointing to a global manufacturing slowdown worsened by persistent global inflation and tight monetary policies. Russia's Vladimir Putin says Moscow had successfully conducted a test on a next-generation nuclear-powered missile. He also declined to rule out that Russia might resume nuclear testing, which will be the first time in more than three decades. Yi Seung-ja has more. Russian President Vladimir Putin announced Thursday that Moscow has successfully carried out a test of a new generation of nuclear-powered cruise missiles capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. Nuclear-powered missiles have virtually unlimited range. According to Russia's state news agency RIA Nosfosti, citing President Putin, the successful test of the Burevestnik, a global-range cruise missile with a nuclear installation, a nuclear propulsion system, was conducted. In an appearance at the Valdai Forum in Sochi, the Russian leader spoke to analysts and journalists and announced that Russia had also almost completed work on its Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile system, which would also mark another key element of its new generation of nuclear weapons. While Russia has not conducted a nuclear weapons test in over three decades, Putin has not ruled out the possibility it could resume such testing. He stressed that the U.S. had signed but not ratified the 1996 Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, despite the fact that Russia had both signed and ratified it. Based on that, Putin said it would be possible for the Russian parliament to revoke its ratification, allowing for a nuclear weapons test. Putin also reminded the world of Russia's nuclear might, warning that any country that decides to use nuclear weapons against Russia would see the launching of hundreds of missiles in response, giving the enemy little chance of survival. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. And less than a month after Putin met up with North Korea's Kim Jong-un, America's CBS News reported that North Korea has begun transferring artillery to Russia. Meanwhile, the U.S. is speeding up to aid Ukraine. Kim jong sil has the details. North Korea is reportedly providing Russia with weapons. According to CBS News, on Thursday, a U.S. official told the American news channel that the move bolsters Russian President Vladimir Putin's forces some 20 months into their invasion of Ukraine. CBS called the North Korean support a possible culmination of the summit last month in Moscow when Kim Jong-un made a rare train trip to meet Putin in person. Putin implied after the summit that he and Kim had discussed military cooperation and CBS said to at least some degree the cooperation appeared to be taking shape this week. The news outlet, however, added that it's unclear whether the artillery transfer is part of a new long-term supply chain or a more limited consignment. It is also unclear what North Korea is getting in return for the weapons. Meanwhile, the White House has strongly condemned Russia for Thursday's attack on civilians in eastern Ukraine. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said it's horrifying if you go to grocery stores with your kids, an explosion happens and bodies are everywhere. This is, again, what the president keeps talking about over and over again. Uh, we have to be, continue to support the people of Ukraine because this is the horrifying nature that they live in every day. The press secretary added that President Biden will give a major speech on continuing to support Ukraine, possibly without going through Congress. The announcement comes as U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's removal from his role makes it challenging for Congress to debate over future U.S. support for Ukraine. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News.
The second round of Fukushima wastewater release by Japan is now ongoing and will go on until the 23rd. And South Korea is keeping a close eye on the discharge to make sure the process is safe and sound. Our foreign affairs correspondent Peunji reports. Japan has begun to discharge a second batch of wastewater from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the sea. Just like the first batch that was released from August 24th to September 11th, a total of about 7,800 tons of water will be heading into the Pacific Ocean. The process will take 17 days until October 23rd, meaning around 460 tons a day will be released. The South Korean government confirmed at a press briefing that the plant operator began the process on Thursday morning. The Tokyo Electric Power Company started to release the second batch of water at 10.30 a.m. And our inspection team is also currently monitoring related data. As I have said before, our government will do its best to make sure that it does not affect the health or safety of Koreans. But despite government reassurances, civic groups in South Korea rallied outside the Japanese embassy in Seoul on Thursday, holding up signs that read, Stop Ocean Dumping. The protesters urged Japan to immediately halt the release process, saying samples of the second batch of wastewater contained a small amount of radioactive material, such as cesium. They said this shows that the ALP system cannot remove radioactive material from the wastewater completely and that they cannot trust the Japanese government that's been saying the water is safe. Meanwhile, a Chinese local news outlet also strongly criticized Japan's latest move. Citing Einar Tangen, a senior fellow at a Beijing-based think tank, the Global Times on Thursday called Japan a rogue nation, saying that it was releasing nuclear garbage without addressing concerns from its neighbors or its people. This comes as Japan was hit hard by China's decision to drastically cut Japanese seafood imports. In August, when Japan began the first release, imports fell by around 70 percent compared to the same month a year earlier. Despite concerns, Japan plans to discharge about 2 percent of the wastewater stored in the Fukushima power plant by March next year. A total of 1.34 million tons of water, enough to fill 500 Olympic-sized swimming pools, will be discharged over the next 30 years. This means Japan will have to release a larger amount of water starting next year. Pound Arirang News. And the South Korean government once again stressed that Japan's Fukushima wastewater release meets international standards while calling for a safe discharge at an international maritime organization meeting. Now, during that meeting in London on Thursday, Saros Ocean's ministry said the first discharge was reviewed and concluded to be in accordance with international standards. It called on the international community to ensure a continued safe discharge through measures such as the IAEA's on-site monitoring. South Korea also cited the 1975 London Convention that stipulated taking preemptive measures in case of dangerous maritime dumping while highlighting the need for transparent data sharing. The World Trade Organization on Thursday lowered its 2023 global trade growth forecast to 0.8 percent from 1.7 percent in April. The WTO cited a global manufacturing slowdown for the latest forecast, adding that global trade and output slowed abruptly in the fourth quarter of 2022 as the effects of persistent inflation and tighter monetary policies seen in major economies such as the U.S. and the EU bloc. And it also pointed to the war in Ukraine as casting a shadow on the outlook for trade. However, it has left projections for 2024 nearly unchanged at 3.3 percent. The WTO also expects a real-world GDP to grow by 2.6 percent and market exchange rates in 2023 and by 2.5 percent in 2024. High inflation here in the country is now hitting the supermarket shelves, specifically people's go-to dairy products like milk. And that's not all. Our Shin ha young has more. Starting in October, the Korea Dairy Committee raised the price of raw or unpasteurized milk by 88 Korean won or 8.8 percent to 1,084 won, which is about 80 U.S. cents per liter. 
This is the steepest increase since 2013, when the country introduced a unique system for determining raw milk prices based on production costs rather than supply and demand to protect dairy farmers and facilitate better price negotiation. Following the increase in raw milk prices, South Korea's major dairy companies have raised their prices for a liter of milk by around 3 to 6 percent. Consumers are expected to be hit hard by rising milk prices, with skyrocketing shopping cart prices already putting a dent in their wallets. As I get older, I find myself drinking about a glass of milk a day, so I tend to choose buy one, get one free deals. Milk is not the only item affected by rising prices. It seems like the prices of meat and seafood have really gone up. There were things that used to be relatively affordable in the past, but now rising prices made me hesitate to buy them. In fact, global sugar prices have hit a 12-year high, hinting at increased processed food prices for the rest of this year. This is due to recent severe droughts and abnormal weather conditions, which have been affecting major sugar exporters, particularly India, the world's largest sugar-producing country. Following the tightened oil supply from the OPEC+, Plus, rising oil prices is another concerning factor. According to the Korean National Oil Corporation, as of Monday, the average price of gasoline at gas stations nationwide increased for 12 consecutive weeks. Starting this Saturday, subway fares in the capital region will be hiked for the first time in eight years. One expert emphasized easing inflation expectations as a measure for the government to control overall inflation. If everyone starts expecting prices to keep going up, it tends to trigger a continuous rise. So easing inflation expectations is crucial. That means the government needs to demonstrate its commitment to price stability, securing trust from the public regarding the matter. Earlier this week, Seoul's top office said the Yoon song yeol administration will focus on improving the cost of living and continue to manage price levels in the fourth quarter of this year. Shin ha Arirang News. The 2023 Nobel Prize in Literature went to Norwegian author Jan Fosse. The Swedish Academy in Stockholm praised his innovative plays and said he gave voice to the unsayable. Fosse is one of the most widely performed playwrights in the world and was awarded the biggest prize in global theater, the Ibsen Award, back in 2010. Now, the remaining Nobel Prizes to be announced are those in peace and economic sciences due on Friday and next Monday, respectively. It's definitely sweater weather here in South Korea, which means the winter season will come before we know it. That also rings a bell for a flu vaccination. For more, we're joined by Professor Howard Lee this morning. Good to have you back. Good morning to you. Uh, Professor, South Korean health authorities are advising to get vaccinated for both flu and coronavirus this winter. Now, why is it necessary to get both of them? Well, I think I can give you uh, three reasons. First, uh, we are entering into a season uh, where flu can become epidemic. So we need some sort of protection against flu, uh, particularly if you are older than 65. Second, the level of antibodies uh, to COVID-19 might not be sufficiently high enough to protect us from becoming seriously ill by the infection. It is primarily because most of us had the last COVID-19 shot uh, more than six months ago. The third reason, uh, which I think is more important, uh, is that we have a couple of studies uh, published recently where co-vaccination with COVID-19 and flu was just as effective and safe as getting alone, or one after the other. So. It is more convenient uh, getting both shots at one time, while we don't need to worry too much about any problem with that. Right, especially if you're older, uh, 65 <laughs> or older, it is definitely recommended. And, and for a lot of us, it's been more than half a year since we got vaccinated sure. for COVID-19. So yep. that probably has worn out already. Now, then which vaccination will be used this time for COVID-19? I mean, is there a newly developed one? Uh, that's true. We will get uh, messenger RNA vaccines made by either Pfizer or Madonna. Mm -hmm. But this time, both of, of them are based on the new uh, dominant subvariant, uh, which is XBB 1.5. Uh, 
So the vaccines are more protective than the previous bivalent vaccines. Uh, and at the same time, they got cleared from the rate agencies, uh, as well as, uh, I mean, including uh, the MFDS in South Korea. Additionally, a protein subunit vaccine by Novavax will be also important soon for those who are not recommended to take the uh, mRNA vaccine. Definitely. Now, that will be just one shot I heard this time. Why is it right. not two or three like during the pandemic years that we had to? Uh, it's because our bodies can memorize the one that we got previously, uh, either through uh, vaccine or infection. Uh, this is quote unquote uh, uh, immune memory. So we, we need just one uh, instead of two or three this time. So our bodies are pretty smart to remember the vaccine. That's, that's correct. That's correct. Then do you, Professor Lee, actually rec recommend getting vaccinated for COVID-19 this fall and winter? I mean, the answer is pretty obvious, I think. But uh, why is that? Because pandemic is over, I have to say. Yeah, of course, the pandemic is over, as you have just said. But we still live with a virus. Mm -hmm. They are not gone completely yet. Not only that, as I said before, the level of antibody uh, against COVID-19 has been continuously decreasing since we had the last one. Uh, so I strongly recommend you to get one this time again. So it is OK to get both flu and COVID-19 vaccine Absolutely. on the same day? Would that be OK? Yeah, so you just go to the clinic, whatever uh, place that you like to go to and just get one. Of course, you, made a res you have to make a reservation beforehand. Right, yeah. then it would be okay to have them just back to back either, right? Yeah, of course. You just got one shot on one of your sh shoulders and the other one the other. I see. Now, the COVID-19 vaccination will still be free of charge this winter, right? And now, can you... Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it is fully covered by the mm -hmm. government as long as you are 12 years or older. However, full vaccine is not free if you are over 12 but under 65. Right. Now, how much can we actually expect to get that a flu vaccine? Because I remember that was pretty costly. Uh, well, I don't recall. Actually, uh, I mean, all the flu vaccines that I got uh, was free uh, from the hospitals, <laughs> okay. uh, hospital workers. So, uh, right, I don't so you have to be vaccinated. Uh, how much that was. But yeah, well, I think y y your recollection might be correct. Right. But but still affordable to avoid that all the winter yeah. hassle. Yeah, absolutely. You should go get one, but this time to uh, both. Right, because COVID is free for those who are aged above uh, 12. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, well, you know what? Uh, if, if you live in the United States, you have to uh, pay at least 160 bucks for uh, additional COVID-19 vaccine, uh, but you don't need to pay uh, that in South Korea. Definitely. All right. To I remember uh, uh, for our viewers too, just to get uh, both COVID and flu for the brutal winter that's on the way, just around the corner, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Howard Lee, for your insight. As always, you stay warm. Thank you very much. Yeah, you have a good one. Good morning, I'm Matthew Ashley, and we now turn our attention to the 19th Asian Games in Hangzhou, China. We begin with hockey, where South Korea's women's team has advanced to the gold medal match after beating Japan 4-3 in the semi-final penalty shootout. Now, South Korea were leading Thursday's match by two goals at the end of the third quarter, before two late goals by Japan took the match to a shootout. The South Korean team will now be looking to secure their sixth gold in the event, when they come up against China in the final on Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Korea time. Moving on to weightlifting, South Korea bagged a bronze medal in the women's 76-kilogram class. Weightlifter Kim Soo-hyun took third place after lifting a combined total of 243 kilograms with 105 kilograms in snatch and 138 kilograms in clean and jerk.
Now she finished just one kilogram ahead of Chen Wenhui of Chinese Taipei after judges ruled that a contested lift by Kim was valid. Both gold and silver were won by Song Gu Kyung and Jong Chun Hee of North Korea. The bronze marks South Korea's second medal in weightlifting at this year's ASEAN. And finally, South Korea added its second wrestling medal of this year's games with a bronze in the men's Greco-Roman 130kg division. Now, the medal was won by 30-year-old Kim min Sok, who beat Indian opponent Naveen Malik 5-1 on Thursday. The match between Naveen take, took the lead with his first and only point in the first half before Kim came back to score five points following the interval. And now for a look at the medal standings and upcoming schedule. Good morning. We almost needed a cozy sweater for our morning commute. Thermometers are pointing to similar numbers to yesterday, but it feels chillier. And Daegwayeong saw the season's first frost and ice this morning, so it really feels nothing like early October today. But after the highs will rise fast into the 20s, so do expect a dramatic temperature gap between lows and highs today. Do dress accordingly and it's always better to dress a bit warmer when we are heading into the colder month. After the highs will be 2 to 3 degrees higher than yesterday this afternoon under a fair amount of sunshine nationwide. But those in the southern parts of the country will notice more clouds moving in this afternoon. Then there will be light rain through Sunday, but the rest of the country will enjoy fine autumn weather under mostly cloudy skies with more seasonal temperatures for this upcoming three-day weekend. And then next week looks to be sunny and dry. Now that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. We'll be back next week for Tuesday's edition at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time.